Okay, we're going to jump right in so that we can be on time and you guys don't all fall asleep. Um, so to the last session of the evening is um, the open data and civic media. I'm Wendy Folk. I am one of the co-chairs along with my many exhausted friends. Um, and from this, this session, I think we could a absolutely bring a very interesting topic on the, like from libraries, data centers to institutional research centers. Um, this particular session will explore the engagement of data between its users, I would say, and the providers that surround the de our developmental and intrinsic nature of open data. Um, particularly, I think it's interesting to look into how these individuals look into engaging platforms that go beyond a typical data narrative um, that is in the current physical space or architectural space. So these speak speakers in particular will con con consider how um, data is backed and penetrated by the public sphere. Um, we will first start with Alan. Alan Wig is uh, from Temple University and he is gonna be presenting on the ge geography of data centers in a networked urban condition. And um, we will let him do the honors. How do I full screen this? Oh, there. OK. There. Uh, OK. Uh, so thank you for inviting me, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. I have uh, maybe a different take on data, and I hope it provides some context to the discussions that have been ongoing today and kind of thinking about the geography of data centers and the infrastructure that allows data to scale. So I have three points I'm going to make tonight. The first is that data scales through infrastructure, telecommunication systems, digital infrastructure, and the sort of the technologies that allow data to flow and circulate through cities, through regions, and globally. This infrastructure, in turn, has a, a strong, grounded, embodied, you know, material form that also has to go somewhere. It, 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 for data to be accessible everywhere, for ubiquitous computing and pervasive connectivity, it also has to be somewhere. So I'm going to kind of explore that and unpack that. The second point is the data centers are part of an urban and economic uh, reorganization around the knowledge and information economy. And this has consequences as well. It's not just that the data centers are central to the 21st century you know, social exchange and, and the um, and, inform and the information economy, but also that the spaces themselves are part of this legacy and this transition from manufacturing and industry into uh, information. And the final point is just to briefly touch on the enormous amounts of energy, of electricity that are required to power these systems to, to allow data to scale again. So I want to go from visual representations of of the telecommunication systems such as this. This is telegeography's submarine cable map for 2015, modeled on a 19th century map of, uh, of telegraph cables. And you can see it linking the major cities of the world. Of course, there's lots of flows between L London and New York and, and the like. You also see kind of traces of like the colonial legacies of telecommunication between uh, colonies and centers of power. And so this is sort of a visual representation, a map of the internet, of flows of data. But it doesn't really tell us much about where this is, what it does in a particular context. Oops, sorry. Again, this is um, from the Data Center Map blog, which is a great resource for this sort of information. But we see sort of a you know, dot matrix of data centers. We don't see much about where these are beyond just that you know, the 116, this big red dot, in, in New York City, you know, Boston, Philadelphia, the major cities, the major, major hubs of, of the economy today. And finally, to get beyond images such as this of one of, um, of Google's data centers, where it's a pristine, clean, 
environment where our digital lives live, but there's no context beyond this, beyond the walls. We don't see beyond these servers in this anonymous space that could be anywhere. I'll get this right eventually. Uh, so instead, let's look at how we get this data, how it comes to us, to our bodies, to our smartphones, into our, our digital lives. The, massive, the last point of contact, especially if we're out in public space, out in the cities, is through cellular antenna, you know, the, the, the connection between our smartphones and the greater internet, the great, these greater systems, is through these sorts of uh, networked equipment. You see them on tops of smokestacks, on water, water tanks, on the tops of uh, industrial era buildings, on freestanding pylons and other sorts of equipment. But you also see them, I'll draw your attention to uh, the middle left example. This is a church in West Philadelphia the church no longer holds services. There's no congregation. The building itself is actually crumbling. There's trees growing out of it. The roof is caving in. The stained glass is broken. And yet, on the, the top of the steeple, there's an array of cellular antenna. And so the utility of this space has shifted 180 degrees in between you know, the, 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 um, this founding in the early, early 20th century till today. You know, so the utility has gone from a connection to to religion, to God per se, to uh, distributing pervasive connection across the, the neighborhood. This, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this building or at least uh, have, have perhaps walked by it. This is 60 Hudson Street in Lower Manhattan. This is the former uh, Western Union Telegraph Global Headquarters. It's near Wall Street. You know, it was close to the sources of, of industry and power and business and finance when it was built you know, about 100 years ago. Um, this is now the most important building for the internet in the world. I will say with confidence that we all have had some piece of information, some bit of data going through this building today. This is where all the major providers are linking, all the telecommunication providers, as well as you know, Google, Facebook, and the like, are linking their systems together and sharing. So if you have an AT&T cell phone, you're connected into AT&T's network in Boston. It's going out, it's going through that, through this building, perhaps to connect to your email with Google. So telegraph systems. Telegraphs were pieces of paper with information on it. They would travel through pneumatic tubes throughout the building. Pneumatic, empty pneumatic tubes provide a very convenient place to run the cables that are connecting the servers together. They also require a very thick concrete floor. That floor allows you to um, carry the weight of those servers as well. Andrew Bloom has a book called Tubes that goes into detail about this space and its relationship to the city that's quite good. So if that piece of data is, is traveling across the uh, continent, it's likely traveling alongside a railroad right of way. This is a, um, alongside the Amtrak Northeast Corridor right of way in West Philadelphia. And you see the, the white and orange marker in the foreground. This is that terrestrial buried fiber optic cable that carries the data. It travels along the railroad right of way because it has to travel somewhere railroads and other forms of um, you know, transportation infrastructure have, have cuts that cut through cities, cuts through the countryside, allows access for the, uh, the lane and, and the maintenance of these systems. Um, as it continues, it maybe would go through this to this building, one Wilshire in downtown Los Angeles. This is the West Coast's most important co-location point, where again, those telecommunication providers and, and data providers are physically meeting their systems in, in one room, the meet me room, where uh, we, we come together. From here, if that, that piece of data is leaving the, uh, the continent and traveling to Asia or beyond, it might go through this point. This is the, the landing point of one of the, um, the submarine fiber optic cables that crosses the Pacific. And so this amazing system, this for data to scale, for us to, to have uh, our network selves, this mundane, light green, you know, caution buried cable, do not dig box, this is the internet, this is data. And it's kind of backed by this lovely California scene. This is Second Street in Hermosa Beach. Um, cyclists, palm trees, uh, sort of classic 
stucco bungalow uh, apartment complex, and then beyond into the ocean. So if we scale back to a regional scale, to pull back from that global telecommunications to, to one particular city, a return to Philadelphia, and return to AT&T, this is um, AT&T's major organization point for the regional telecommunication for Philadelphia. This is at the, the southwest corner of the Central Business District. It's actually quite near to uh, University of Pennsylvania along the Schuylkill River. You can see the downtown on the left in the background. Um, it's alongside the railroad right-of-way. Again, that's where the, the cables are run, so this proximity is, is quite important. This was a, a, um, a cooling center, a um, refrigeration point for food. It was a coal yard before that. And now in the 1970s, AT&T, during the Cold War era where telecommunications and maintaining these connections was quite important for national safety, they built this bunker. It's immense, it towers over the neighborhood. There's no sort of access points that are open to the public. It's you know, a neighborhood of the built or settled in the, the mid to late 19th century, two to three story row homes. And you know, this, this thing you know, lurks over the space, but it also is the center, it's the connection point for our, our digital lives. So just to kind of highlight these juxtapositions between security and connection. So perhaps that data is traveling to someone moving alongside the, uh, along the freeway, along the Pennsylvania Turnpike, leaving central Philadelphia and going out into the suburbs. So this is alongside the, uh, the, the freeway in Norristown, about 15, 20 miles from Philadelphia proper. And we see a cellular antenna site uh, built on top of a high voltage electricity pylon. And so both this layering of infrastructure, now we have transportation, energy, and communication data. And so this equipment is DC power equipment, radio transmitting equipment, cooling, a base station transceiver that's managing the, the interchange between the user and the back end, the, the communicative exchange. This is what it takes for data to scale, this specific sorts of arrays of equipment. There are at least 1.9 million cellular antennas in the United States. That means this much equipment is, is there two million times, and probably more. You know, this heavily embedded, very fixed stuff is what, what makes data. I get to pull again to consider sort of industrial, this juxtaposition between industrial and, and 21st century. This is the Frankfurt Chocolate Factory in South Philadelphia, you know, uh, 1880s chocolate factory. It's now vacant. There's no, no use of this building. There's no, no occupants. Uh, the windows are, are bricked in even. Um, but the smokestack on the left is home to some T-Mobile cellular antennas. And so from manufacturing to providing information. This is what I find a fascinating example. This is Comcast. They have a little data center. I'm not sure exactly what this is doing. It's actually close to that uh, AT&T building in South Philadelphia. And they disguised it as a row home, or as two row homes side to side. It even has a mailbox. Um, the only reason you'd, say, you'd see that this is not just a row home, aside from the fact that no one lives there, is this on the right, you see a, a large backup power generator, larger than, than any individual home would ever need. OK, last, last example of this. Um, proximity to data does not equate to accessing data. You know, for data to scale, for it to be useful, for, for us to have this necessitates hardware, software, and you know, the sort of complex equipment, not just proximity. Here's a homeless encampment built on top of one of those fiber optic cables along the railroad tracks underneath the Walnut Street Bridge in, in downtown Philadelphia. Okay, so I titled this talk, The Geography of Data Centers in the Networked Urban Condition. Networked urbanization is a way of theorizing cities through their infrastructure, and not just water power, transportation, but also digital infrastructure, and to consider how cities are formed through these, these ethereal electromagnetic bases of, uh, of our digital lives, for instance. And so 
This is an emblematic example of the networked urban condition for Philadelphia today. We, you know, Philadelphia, large uh, industrial city. It was considered the workshop of the world in the, the 19th century. Now it's sort of a second tier global city, has a strong central business. Three minutes? Okay. Um, okay, good. That sounds about better. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I would got a timing marker. Okay, so, but I'll speed up anyway. Uh, this is, you see the Central Business District in the background, one of the Liberty II skyscrapers sticking up on the right-hand side, City Hall in the center. The building on the left is the sort of center of the modern industrial city's information and data exchange. This is the former site of the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper, the newspaper of record for Philadelphia. It is now vacant. It has plans to be turned into a high-end casino and hotel. And so from, from information to service industry, on the left, we have the Terminal Commerce Building. This is an 11-story, 1.3 million square foot furniture, wholesaler, and warehouse built in 1932. Lovely, you know, blonde brick, Art Deco styling. At its peak in the late 40s and early 50s, this building had its own post office, its own zip code, housed 175 companies employing 5,000 people. So it's a square block, 11 stories tall, employing 5,000 people. As part of the familiar story of the deindustrialization of American cities, you know, the, the industry left, the uh, warehouses, manufacturing, and logistics moved to the suburbs and to the peripheries to be close to the freeways for the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the need to, to uh, move goods by a truck, not railroad. But this building has one of those railroad spurs that would originally would load uh, goods in and out, load furniture in and out of the building, and that's what allows it to connect into the, the, the data transmission, you know, the internet infrastructure. So here's the sort of example of a, a picture of it at its height. You can see this uh, furniture in the front, lo very lovely for part of the city. And again, as it today, there's no real public face. It's, it's very inward looking. It's, it's home to maybe 100 or 200 at most network engineers who are maintaining those servers, but it definitely is not part of the city in the same fashion. What it is, though, is the first data center for the United States. I can't confirm this, but this is I'm taking from a newspaper article. This is where SunGuard, a Pennsylvania-based data transmitter, I don't know how many of you use the, the Blackboard software on your coursework. SunGuard owns Blackboard. So they started their offsite data recovery, data disaster recovery, here in this building in 1978. In the late 90s, as part of the original dot com boom, this building became uh, a commercial data center with multiple carriers. There's 80 carriers today, and there is an interchange between the data providers and the telecommunication providers that, you know, that get the information out to us. It's a very good location because it's right between New York and Washington, D.C., the two you know, major centers of political and economic power for uh, the United States. It also connects into those submarine cable link networks, but you also really see here just the, 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 the connection into the regional uh, data grid. So what does it take to provide this? Well, it takes a lot of energy. Here, on the, you see the an aerial view of the Terminal Commerce Building. These um, gray bricks on the roof are cooling systems. You know, computers take a lot of power, and so you have to cool it, which uses an enormous amount of energy. Behind it, you have the backup power. Data centers require instant on in case of a power failure. They can't go offline, and so there's double redundant systems in every data center around the world, both uh, lead acid batteries to click on immediately, and then diesel generators for long-term um, maintenance until the power is turned back on. And then there's a there's the regional electrical Electrical utility has a substation behind this. So data centers are using about 2% of the US's energy today. That's not accounting for us charging our devices and the, uh, the multitude of other uses of data, just data centers. Worldwide, this equates to 30 billion watts of electricity, equivalent to 30 nuclear power plants. So this is an enormous amount of data. And there's a, a real, I think, an interesting and important aside here. Data centers only use 10% of their power to maintain these systems, to keep it running, you know, to keep the data 
operational, 90% is held in reserve in case there's a spike in usership, so a website wouldn't go down for, per se. So again, we have an enormous amount of energy use just to keep, sorry, to keep systems functioning, but not actually doing anything. Here's a, a shot from the, that regional, the, um, the power substation, looking back at the backside of the building. And so the potential of data tr to transform design to, to scale occurs within larger assemblages of connection and digital infrastructure and energy use. You know, there's an enormous back end to our mobile lives, to our digitally enabled lives. This is dispersed and distributed globally, but it also has local material impacts in cities around the world, in all cities around the world. So to conclude, data requires this digital and telecommunications infrastructure. There are enormous energy demands to the systems. And the provision of data we see, it ties into economic restructuring, not just in creating our information economy and our digital lives, but also directly in the reuse of these industrial era structures for maintaining data in these data centers. And I'll just leave us with an image of that earlier information processing point, the, uh, the now closed uh, post office for the Terminal Commerce Building. There's still some mailboxes outside, but, but you know, the utility of the post office for, for this particular, for those 5,000 workers is no longer needed, even though information is constantly flowing in and out of this building. So thank you all. While we have um, Raul set up his presentation, um, Raul is going to speak with us on the open data efforts and data-driven decision-making processes that he's created through power disparity between um, those that speak data and those that do not. Uh, Raul is actually coming from um, MIT, yes. <laughs> so just down the road, and uh, he'll talk to us more about it. Yeah, um, if you don't mind, if we could turn up the house lights, that would make it a lot easier for me. Thanks. Um, so I just want to start with a, a quick poll. Um, so uh, raise your hand if you believe that uh, data can be used to actually empower people. OK, great. Um, raise your hand if you believe that data can be used to disempower people. Right, so if you look around, basically everybody raised their hand twice, right? And this is the paradox that we sort of live within when people talk about sort of data informed society and all this stuff. So I'm gonna speak to that paradox. Um, I wanna start with a story, uh, a story about this mural that we helped uh, a bunch of people paint. So uh, if you don't know, Head Start is, basically, is a program in the United States that's federally and state funded that prepares uh, young children of sort of the poor and economically disadvantaged for kindergarten readiness. So this is basically readiness training and preparedness that they offer. So we actually, if you can imagine a room of, uh, of parents of those children and uh, administrators that work in the Head Start program, uh, the funders that actually fund and supplement the Head Start training, uh, and the parent advocates that work within Head Start. So imagine all those people sitting in a room coming together around the data that they had around uh, disparities between the populations that were coming to Head Start and their, and their healthy weight outcomes, right? So this was looking at obesity. So we brought that room of people together and we made this, this mural. So, so that was super fun, first of all. Um, and more importantly, it was an opportunity for us to bring people together around information, around data, to create something. And that, to me, is one of the ways that we try to turn this into an empowerment story, right? To try to say, okay, well, traditionally, there are these people that have the data that collected the data about us, right? It's those people in power that have that information. And then there might be, on the other side, to sort of be reductionist, the people that the data is about. And usually there's this vast isolation between these two. When you put them together, you end up with an opportunity like this. This is from the notebook of one of the parent advocates at that, uh, where we designed that. It says, we have never come together with data before ever. Right? So this is a new thing, the idea that we actually use information to bring people together and try to let, give them ownership of the story. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk about the programs that we do that try to 
produce these results. I'm going to introduce uh, a sort of a scaffolding we use to bring people from information to a story to some kind of visual presentation of that story uh, for an audience and some goals that they think are important. I'm going to give you four examples of hands-on activities we do to do that. And then I'm going to talk about four different communities that we do that with, four different groups of people. Um, and I hope that'll help us together get a sense of why it's important to have arts-based invitations for people to actually play with data, right? So there's this idea, and often when I'm doing workshops, uh, I use the words information and presentation because those are words that are normal for people. Right? Data and visualization are things that conjure up images of black backgrounds and colored dots and gray lines, right? which are very intimidating. So I want to speak to that a little bit. Um, so we try to address this idea that there are those that can speak data and those that don't know how to speak data and try to build in very much this sort of building on sort of the way that Edith talks about things. Um, build a concept of popular data from the popular education approach. The idea that we can actually bring people together and empower them by working with information. The information that ostensibly they should own that is about them. So who are we? Well, so my name is Rahul Bhargav, and I'm a research scientist at the MIT Center for Civic Media, which housed within the Media Lab, which has a great tradition of building things and making things with our hands as a way to understand and try to experiment with that with those new concepts. Um, my wife, Emily Bargov, is my partner in this. She runs Connection Lab, who does arts-based invitations primarily for the public health sector. So she will bring together a group of people and try to tackle a uh, sort of a taboo issue like mental health by doing an arts-based invitation. So we came together and dreamed up the idea of doing some of these activities and making these murals in specific. Because if you want to try to meet community groups where they are, the first thing you do is say, okay, let's make some murals. Because you talk to any community group, you say, oh, okay, can we make a mural? They say, oh yeah, no problem. We got an artist over there. We got some youth over here. We can get together. We can make a mural, no problem. Now you're talking my language, right? So we tried to meet them where they, where they were. So taking a step back from that example, um, the process we introduce starts over here with information that you have. So we start with the idea that you have some information and you want to figure out what it is and what it says. The second step in this process is this idea that you have people, an audience, and some goals that you want to evoke by using that information, right? So information outside of a context of doing something with it is not interesting to me. Um, it's not a problem we work on. This third step up here is the idea that you want to help those people turn it into a story, right? A story that we can tell as part of a larger campaign to use information to create some kind of change in the world, right? So that's using information to create some kind of change. And then the idea is that we can tell that story in a number of ways. But hopefully, over here, we've really well defined our audience and goals that we can use as filters to help us come up with an appropriate way to tell that story. So I'm going to walk through each of those steps and talk about some of the activities we do. So in this first step, this idea of information that you have, this is an invitation that we do that uh, I call the data sculpture activity. And we show up with a suitcase full of craft materials, and we show a tiny set of information that it comes from a group. And we say, OK, you have five minutes to turn something in that tiny, tiny set of information into a physical representation using these materials. And you can't make a bar chart out of Legos. That's just not allowed. That's too easy. Um, you have to do something more fun than that. And the first thing this does is it breaks down that barrier to actually playing with the information to try to understand what it is. Anyone who works with data knows that you need to play and iterate with trying to understand what the information you have is. And just as importantly, if not more importantly, what the information you have isn't, what's missing from it. And this is the way we try to build capacity by inviting people to build something. So this is the first example of an activity that we do. In that second phase of trying to help people define their audience and goals, this is something that's very much participatory, right? So we have a couple activities we do here. As we introduce a conversation, we actually try to get people to think about the different audiences that they're engaging. And usually when you start, you hear an answer of, oh, okay, we want to talk to a general audience and we want to raise their awareness. That's like the most useless answer on the planet. I never let people get away with that because that gives you no filters, right? So if you start over here and say, oh, I have a general audience and I want to raise awareness, 
You come over here, and you want to try to pick a presentation technique. Maybe you want to do a map. Maybe there's an infographic. Maybe you want to have people raise their hands. You have nothing to choose with, right? You have no filters to use. So general audience and, and awareness raising are like the worst answers that I can imagine because they're not helpful to you. So if, it's, if someone says general audience, I say, OK, well, are they people that agree with you or disagree with you? Are they people that, that have money? that can offer you something, or people that don't have money, or the people that have skills, or the people that you're trying to get to do something. Do they want to do that thing? Are they predisposed to be interested in what you're talking about? Do they disagree with it? All these questions can help narrow in on an audience. So those are the activities we do around this. This third step of turning that information that you have with an audience and goal in mind into a story is where we start to do some more building activities. So this is an activity I learned from some designer friends that. Uh, that is about making storybooks. So they do this great activity where you take a big piece of paper, you've probably done this, and you fold it in an appropriate way and you cut it down the middle and then you get a four page storybook. And the idea is that you can try to look at your information and find a story in it, a process that we scaffold and facilitate um, to do capacity building. And then once you have a story, you can try to work on the narrative of that story by making a book out of it. So often you end up in a situation where someone's had some sort of insight in the data that they're working with, but they aren't able to quite make that leap into turning it into a story that can capture and engage people. And we find that this process of designing, say, a children's storybook or a comic book that tells that story is a very effective way to turn that into a narrative because everyone gets what a page turn is, right? Like a page turn is a step in the process of unfolding a story. And that page turn is critically important to turning some sort of insight or factoid or maybe a comparison story into something that people can actually follow along and, and try to understand and engage with. So another attempt to make sort of working with information playful and fun. In addition, a lot of these activities, as you see, are not about working on computer screens because we know that the tools that we use embody a set of assumptions and theories that are essentially blinders, right? Like as soon as you open something up in Excel, you're stuck in Excelville, right? And like I don't get like getting stuck in Excelville. I don't know how many of you do, but the affordances that tool allows are, are constraining and are not helpful constraints. They're not the constraints that allow you to actually explore and play. They're constraints that actually restrict you. So we urge people to go back to the materials that are constrained in a different way, right? So we're you know, using crayons and paper. And you can translate that back into digital tools and back into physical as much as you want to. But it's important not to get stuck in one or the other. So that's the third phase. So the fourth phase of picking an appropriate technique to tell that story. We do a number of exercises to actually help people think about the strengths and weaknesses of various techniques. And they can, like I said, techniques can be anything from maps to charts to sort of an interactive participatory game where people can actually be the information, be the data and represent it. Uh, to to uh, murals, as we just showed earlier. Um, this example is a tr classic design example that is a visual word web. So you start with an abstract concept, like security in this case, and people draw out the pictures of, uh, so draw out words that are related. And then after they do that for a couple of minutes, we say, okay, now put stickies on there and draw the things that you think you can draw. So we collaboratively create this visual vocabulary, which distributes ownership within the room of people, right? It's not that Sally's idea. Everyone came up with these different visual vocabulary, and often multiple people come up with the same idea. So it's this very collaborative approach. So these are four examples of the activities that we do to try to sort of create an engaging and participatory experience of working with information, of working with data. Now, if you take a step back from those, we have about 12 or 15 of those that we've documented on our website, datatherapy.org. Um, and we have a blog and pictures and how-tos and more murals and examples on there because we're trying to actually figure out how different people can stitch these together. So how do we stitch these activities together to actually help people work with information and data? How do we actually empower people to work with the information and tell a story that they're interested in? 
So I'm going to give you four communities very quickly that we've worked with. One is these sort of community groups. Here are examples of two other murals. The top one is sort of a much more of a uh, community mural look and feel. The bottom one is this giant infographic not far away from here, actually near the Taza Chocolate Factory in Somerville. Um, both of these were designed uh, in three sessions. We facilitated them. We stitched together those activities that lead us from information to uh, audience and goals, to a story, to a visual design, and then painted them. And we can evaluate the short-term outcomes of capacity building for people that were involved, and the longer-term outcomes are still being evaluated. We can look at the first mural that I showed you, and we have stories about people seeing resources in that mural and going to actually take advantage of them in other places. So we have direct impacts for people that were viewers. And we have direct and longer term impacts for people that were participating in the design of this. That's one audience. Second audience, of course, the journalist. I work at the Center for Civic Media. We do a lot of work with journalists. As they try to reinvent the future of journalism, no surprise, there's a ton of data journalism work. We stitch together these activities, particularly focused on storytelling, to create workshops for journalists um, and, and try to build their capacity to use this not only for telling stories, but also to engage readers. Third, we work with the professionals, the people that, as I described earlier, are sort of the ones in power. We try to help them think about appropriate ways to present for their audiences. So there's this great example of a community meeting I went to where they showed this Gapminder style presentation with bubbles. It was a community meeting for, from a local government, right? So regular people were going to this. So there's this Gapminder style presentation with bubbles flying up and down on multiple four-dimensional axes. And I looked around, and I was like, oh my god. Oh my god, I can't believe they're showing this. Totally inappropriate for your audience, not narrated at all. That's the problem we try to solve by helping these people in power try to actually engage their community around the data uh, to actually give back ownership and empowerment. For example, is the artists. So we're working with these graffiti artists in Kenya. So this is Banks, Slave, Uhuru, and Swift, three of the premier uh, graffiti artists in Kenya. And we're training them to actually figure out how to bring together the citizen journalists that are working in Nairobi, the NGOs that have data and information, and the artists to actually be able to paint murals about issues that they care about within Nairobi. And these guys are doing great work there and using the information to bring people together. So those are four examples. And all of these try to sort of bridge this capacity building approach, right? The idea that for everyone, we want to build their capacity to work with information and data. Because otherwise, there's going to be people left out of this sort of world we're in now where there is data being logged everywhere. And this, to us, speaks to sort of the people that talk about data literacy. And of course, when you talk about literacy, you have this sort of, you can't just talk about the sort of classic literacy is about being learning to read, right? Literacy is not about, about learning to read. It's about having everyone become a writer, right? So we're trying to create more writers. That's the approach we're taking with the data capacity building work that we do. And that, to us, is an opportunity to have everyone speak the same language. And that really matters, because when you have data-driven decision-making happening, especially in governments and other civic environments, there's a moral and ethical obligation to make sure that everyone can speak data enough to be involved and engaged. Because otherwise, you're going to end up in this situation where you're speaking data in some way, and the citizens around you can't understand it at all. And that's a disempowerment story. And we can't allow that to happen. Um, that's sort of a classic story that's happened over and over again with different disciplines. We strongly believe we can't allow that to happen. So that's the way we're attacking this. So if you're interested in these activities, uh, check out our websites. Um, there are people that are contributing around the world to these activities and these approaches and stitching them together in different ways. That's very rewarding for me because I've learned and came up with half of these activities by doing them with other people. And we strongly believe this is sort of a new opportunity to bring people together around information to create a new role as, of citizens as sort of data analysts, right? If we can bring people together to find stories and information, that's a new opportunity to engage people as citizens and to try to build a new model of civic engagement. 
And that's the thing that we're very interested in. Opportunities to sort of piggyback on all this hype around data and information. To actually piggyback and turn something that in a lot of ways is a disempowerment story into an empowerment story. So uh, I hope some of these activities are useful to you. Please check out the resources. Um, and thank you very much for your time. So as we um, continue, we're going to have our friends from the Loeb Library. We're going to have Sarah, Ines, and Get. Oh man, I'm like totally losing it tonight. Yaina uh, to um, speak to us about how, together ar as archivists, data librarians, and a research librarian, all of those has been fundamentally changing and sh and shaped by the changes of technology. So in our careers, we have witnessed. Um, kind of a shift from analog to digital architecture um, and architectural drawings and explosion of different types of tools that allow the creation of data and a move from print to digital scholarship. Um, these ladies will present us the examples of how technology has changed by the way that we are designers, that how we conceive our work and how they will discuss and consider the anticipating future use of the afterlife of data. So there's gonna be a talk of um, I would say uh, open data um, and and various forms of that. Um, so we welcome Yanina, Ines, and Sarah. Uh, good evening. Thank you for staying so late on a Friday evening, and thank you to the Doctor Design students who actually organized this. It's been a great great day. Um, the title of our talk is Data Projection. Uh, this is a three-person presentation, so that's important. Uh, the title of our talk is Data Projections, Anticipating Future Use. My name is Ines Alduendo. I am here today with my colleagues Janina Mueller and Sarah Dickinson. Um, in Anticipating Future Use, we will present our views today from slightly different angles. As an archivist, I will discuss collecting and archiving digital design drawings. Yanina is a de design data librarian who will discuss her active participation in the creation of data. And Sarah is a research librarian who will discuss the benefits of making research data open to the world. Data, information, and knowledge are at the core of archival science. Part intellectual discipline, part pragmatic practice, it is a field dedicated to gathering, arranging, and describing data in order to create frameworks of understanding and interpretation. If the essence is data and records, the purpose is information and knowledge. I will focus today on architectural drawings, how their nature has changed with digital technology, and how that change opens up new ways of thinking in archival theory and practice. I will also argue that strategies for the preservation of digital data today are crucial for access to that data tomorrow. Three considerations to frame the discussion on digital drawings. First, I do not think of architectural drawings as data, but understand them more broadly as representations, abstractions, or visual translations. However, even if conceptually they are not data, from a strictly computational sense, Born digital architectural drawings are indeed made up of bits and bytes. Therefore, when thinking about digital drawings, and in particular about their preservation, we can think of them as data. Second, drawings are by no means an integral part of architecture's specificity as a discipline. Architecture has to do with formal, spatial, and structural ideas and their interrelationships. Even in contemporary architecture circles where there may be an emphasis on computational technique because it enables greater formal control, the conceptual shift brought along with digital technology is not related to the drawings per se being analog or digital. Likewise, the specificity of archival science has nothing to do with the media of records. It has to do with the provenance and original order the archival principles that inform the arrangement and description of collections, no matter what the media of records. However, the third consideration is the following. An analog architectural drawing is the record's intrinsic content. 
whereas in a digital drawing, the content always needs an environment made up of software, hardware, and computer files to render it. Because these environments are mostly proprietary and dynamic, that is to say they keep evolving and changing, they bring along for archives the concern of digital continuity. This is indeed the paradigm shift. It has to do with a process by which and context within which the records that document architectural thought and practice are created and therefore the possibility or not of the preservation of data. We need more sophistication in the knowledge of how data is generated and what the preservation alternatives are. The shift in the nature of born digital drawings impacts archival practice in fundamental ways that have to do with legal, curatorial, and technological matters. From a legal perspective, the impact is in the acquisition of born digital collections. The nature of digital files indicates that they need to be collected and captured at or near creation. For most collecting institutions, donors have generally come to us near the end of their careers when they want to transfer the totality of their files to a repository. The difficulty is that in a born digital landscape, this is nowhere close to the moment of creation of those files. At the other end, when careers are beginning, data creators do not know where they want their records to ultimately go, so they are hesitant to donate their files. In addition, in some countries, owner-generated agreements with architects contain a provision that vests the client with the ownership of the architect's drawings. This makes the feasibility of a deed of gift, which is the legal instrument by which as curators we generally acquire collections, almost impossible with born digital architectural files. Therefore, we find ourselves considering non-exclusive license agreements in lieu of deeds of gift as a possible legal instrument for the acquisition of born digital collections. From a curatorial perspective, the impact is in our agency in building collections, establishing connections within and between collections, and surrounding a work with a network of data that enables discovery. In terms of building collections, when we acquire digital files through non-exclusive license agreements, then donors return the right to provide those same files to others in the future. Considering this, together with the traditional sense of an original drawing vis-a-vis -vis the ease of re reproducibility of digital files, will we then be moving away from uniqueness of collections in terms of exclusivity of files towards a shift where, the, where other parameters will be the drivers of collection strength? Will the strength of an institution's collection also be in how the files are described, linked, and made accessible so that individual digital objects are co correctly contextualized and integrity of bits ensured? Tools where capture a description of data is not only scalable, but that it allow both for description of content and context at the collection level and at further levels of granularity will become increasingly significant. Metadata, descriptive, administrative, and structural is critical for responsible management and meaningful discoverability of data. This is particularly true in a global landscape where data is increasingly distributed and researchers expect access through digital means. What in archival circles is known as contextual mass will foster broader access, which in turn will advance research and scholarship. If in the past, archivists were perceived as gatekeepers of information, I see our role today as enablers of knowledge. Lastly, the third perspective is technological. Many of us argue that the born digital drawing is the archival original, not the printout copy, and that we need to better understand their digital nature. In computer-aided design, a drawing is defined as a set of objects and coordinates where the object definitions are stored internally in a database. The software plots the drawing from those coordinates and object definitions to a computer screen or directly to a plotter. Computer-aided computer design also supports 3D modeling, be it through geometry, appearance, or scene. In a skeletal geometry, the model is stored as 3D points or vertices, and the surfaces thus generated are stored as a series of polygons or faces. However, when the modeling is done through constructive solid geometry by adding or subtracting volumes from one another, an exact solid is stored as opposed to a set of vertices, edges, and faces. 
The difficulty is in the conversion from one type of tree definition to another, resulting in, in errors literally tr lost in translation. The data cannot be mapped, and you end up with lines that do not meet at corners, surfaces that do not meet at lines, or volumes that do not form closed solids. There has been much recent discussion if these errors are due to the inconsistency in the definition of data or if the solution is outside of numerical analysis. The idea of providing a framework for error analysis is indeed a discussion in computational science. An evolving digital landscape complicates digital curation, which, which encompasses both digital preservation and digital access to data. That is to say, activities necessary for the current and long-term availability of born digital files. The archival community has already carried out a series of studies and initiatives that provide a good foundation to understand the problem, and archivists are also applying digital forensics principles as possible preservation strategies. Even when cloud storage may be an appealing and economic solution for individuals, it is not responsible stewardship of data in institutions. The awareness of the need of preservation strategies can be done within design schools and architecture or landscape offices by advocating for the reading, understanding, and implementation of standards and by establishing preservation workflows when closing a project. The OAIS reference model is one good example of a standard to follow. As producers and collectors of data, we are deeply immersed in an evolving digital landscape. If we are interested in the future use and availability of our, of our data, it offers us the opportunity to collaborate in devising preservation and access strategies and in establishing trusted digital repositories. In anticipating future use, pres preservation of data today is access to data tomorrow. The library is a partner in this process, from data creation to data reuse. Next, Yanina uh, will present how we are actively participating in the creation of data. All right. As a data librarian, I'm looking at the issue of data in the design field from a slightly different angle. At than my colleague Inez. Whereas Inez's specialty is to think about the long-term archiving of analog and digital material, I focus more on the inclusion and use of digital data in design projects. I in particular, I provide assistance in the finding and using of data, and that I focus on mostly, mostly is uh, geospatial data. Uh, most geospatial data that researchers use are collected and processed by third parties, such as governments and um, private companies. Although the availability of spatially referenced data is becoming more common, large regional differences continue to exist. Data for North American and European sites are relatively easy to acquire, whereas uh, getting access to African, Asian, and South American data can be far more challenging and costly. Regardless of location, even if data are available, they might not be up to date or their resolution might not be high enough to support smaller scale site analyses. Or sometimes the site we are particularly interested in was covered by clouds at the time the satellite image was taken. It's not uncommon to have to use data that were created five years ago or earlier as recently remote, recent remote sense data are really hard to come by. But the cheapening of technologies and their increasing ease of use give designers and scholars opportunities to overcome some of these challenges. Technology allows us to create customized data ourselves, data that are accurate, up-to-date, and have high resolution. In 2004, when the European Space Agency la launched its deep space probe Rosetta, it was armed with the latest digital imagery technology a four megapixel camera. Today, most of our cell phones have high resolution cameras. This just shows that advances in technology are rapid and have opened up new possibilities for data collection and production for all of us. I worked together with GSD students last year in exploring the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as drones, as a mapping tool for landscape architects and ecologists. 
We bought a drone, as you can see here on the screen, learned how to fly it and to collect images with it from the air. We then used Structure for Motion software to create customized 3D landscapes. On the screen are examples of some data we produced. Um, if you're interested to learn more about it, I encourage you to come to the library. We have an installation up that shows some of these projects in more detail. With the tools and technologies available to us, we suddenly gain control and flexibility over the data collection and production. For example, we can control when the data are collected, which means we can avoid clouds and fly close enough to the ground to get high resolution data. Furthermore, newer technologies and increasing storage capacity allow us to collect a huge amount of data. Theoretically, we could fly our drone over a site every hour of every day. This begs the question, how do we organize the data? How do we assure that they are usable and comprehensible in 5, 20, and 50 years? Libraries and archives at research institutions are very interested in these questions. Librarians and archivists have expertise in the area of data creation, data management, and data archiving. And often they provide a digital repository infrastructure in support. We advocate for data management principles at the point of data creation. This includes addressing issues of data format, data documentation, data organization, as well as thinking about long-term storage and access. For the data to be reusable, shareable, and understandable, they need to be in a stable data format and accompanied by metadata that adhere to standards. In academic libraries, scholars can get data management support. Often, libraries provide access to a repository infrastructure that students and scholars can use for depositing their data. Also, libraries can provide guidance in writing data management plans that address all aspects of data sharing, reuse, and storage. Here at Harvard, researchers can deposit their data in a repository called Dataverse. Dataverse allows you to create metadata that adheres to particular metadata standards, and it also allows you to restrict the data if you don't want to share it with everyone. You can also um, upload various versions of the data and don't lose older, older versions. The drone project that I mentioned earlier uses Dataverse as a way to manage and share some of the data products. To sum up, the principles of data plans and data sharing are the foundation of what we call open data. The idea is to share research data with others without permission and payment barriers so they can be reused and built upon. Open data aims to further interdisciplinary exchange of research and development technologies and methodologies. In these ways, it is very similar to, open so to the open, soft open source software community and uh, the Creative Commons licenses um, that have similar goals. We encourage data creators to work with libraries so that we and humanity as a whole do not lose this vast user-generated data landscape. Open data fits into a larger movement, namely the open access movement, and I'm going to hand it over to Sarah who will speak more about that now. So this is a great position to be in, the last speaker at, what, 8 o'clock on, on a Friday afternoon. So this is a challenge. <laughs> so my name is Sarah Dickinson, and I am here to talk about open access and open data as vehicles for ensuring the future life and reach of research. I join my colleagues in offering the view from within the library and archive where we have each engaged in acquiring, preserving, ensure, and ensuring access to information in a wide array of formats. In our work, we each daily face the challenges and opportunities of working with digital content in the design disciplines. Open access and open data movements support the work of scholars and practitioners operating in many fields and address issues specifically outlined in today's conference the production, sharing, 
archiving, use, and reuse of research and data. The aim of both these movements is deeply aligned with the broader social concerns of openness, transparency, and civic participation. Libraries have been important partners in shaping and supporting the open access endeavors of authors. I'd like to highlight two essential areas where our goals and actions intersect. Access and preservation, and the essential role that authors have in determining the afterlife of their research and data. Oh, you saw it already. So if, if you all don't know Peter Suber's work, he is one of the essential um, framers of the open access movement. He's actually the director of the Office of Scholarly Communications here at Harvard. And he provides kind of an essential definition. Open access offers the following concise definition of open access. Open access, literature is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and licensing principles. Two primary ways to achieve open access are through publishing in an open access journal and by depositing the manuscript of work published in traditional journals in an open access repository. The focus for the brief discussion today will be on the way institutional repositories support the goals of authors in ensuring the future life and reach of their research and data. So where will your research go? Who will read it, respond to it, recreate, challenge, or adapt it to new and unexpected uses? Open access removes the barriers that can block readers from connecting with the work of authors and presents the best case of what is possible when information is presented in a digital form and offered without barrier to the public. Yeah. It's Friday night, the battery Friday. has died, right? <laughs> where's our, where's our, our um, power? Yeah, everything. Yeah, it's working now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Did you restart it? So, this is your next one. The mouse there you go. Yeah, now it should work. Cool. Oh, excellent. Great. Okay. So, actually, this is a great graphic. This graphic of the downloaded articles from DASH, which is Harvard's open access repository, makes a really compelling case for the global reach of research. Harvard authors depositing articles from, from across the university have made this global reach possible. This is the reach of just one repository. The Directory of Open Access Repository currently lists 2,600 open access repositories worldwide. Making both your final research and the data available also extends the visibility, readership, and impact across disciplines and irrespective of affiliations. There is a newly, okay, let's go. Oh. I am going to, oh, you're right. Good, we're gonna get there. Okay, so, um, making both your final research and the data available also extends the visibility, readership, and impact across disciplines and irrespective of affiliations. There is a newly launched site at Harvard supporting the saving of data in Harvard's open access uh, data repository that Anita just mentioned. The benefits to scholars articulated here, again, mirror the themes of today's conference, including transparency, collaboration, and research acceleration. Open access repositories help preserve knowledge. These repositories support the long-term preservation of scholarship by providing a stable environment for preservation and distribution of digital content. 
universities and institutions provide one central repository to preserve and make available a range of scholarly output, from peer-reviewed articles and conference proceedings to book chapters and data. Even when our authors cannot make their content publicly available due to previously uh, signed license agreements, uh, third-party content restrictions, or the unavailability of the final of the author's final post-peer-reviewed uh, and edited manuscript, authors can still deposit their manuscripts dark in the archive for long-term preservation and discoverability in a stable environment with the hopes that open access for those will eventually become an option. Libraries play a central role in these repositories, providing information management expertise, integrating OA content in library content discovery platforms, and continuing to educate current and future authors in OA issues and options for access. But ultimately, it's authors that make open access and open data possible. Peter Suber states it plainly, authors control the volume and the growth of open access. They decide whether to, to submit their work to open access journals, whether to deposit their work in open access repositories, and how to use their copyright. Authors may choose to make their work open access for a number of reasons. To comply with their institution's open access policy, because their funding agencies mandate the deposit of final research and increasingly data in a repository. The NIH requirement for deposit in PubMed is a prime example of this. Or because of a personal desire to share their scholarship as widely as possible. Library staff supporting scholarly communication efforts are important resources for authors seeking assistance in navigating the essential components of open access. They work with authors both at a local level in supporting OA activities, but have also built strong international alliances to further this work. Some essential sources of information of OA are listed here, including the Right to Research Coalition, which I should mention is a group that represents seven million students worldwide. And a great source of uh, thing that they put out is optimizing your publishing. A uh, great uh, flyer from that site for any student, students or young researchers in the audience who are exploring open access issues. Um, this is just an example of, uh, of one of the sites, um, the information that's available from the Spark site giving you author rights information. So it's kind of an example of the detailed information that these resources can provide with, if you're navigating all these components of open access. But I can't help but end on a note of advice that will resonate with anyone who's tried to manage uh, the documents of a long research paper, and that is to keep track of your final author's manuscript, the one that you've, after you've submitted it for peer review and it's come back, and your final version. Uh, this is an issue that, has, that faces many authors, um, and it comes up regularly with my work with GSD authors in implementing the GSD's open access policy, which they signed in March of 2011. So keep track of your final, auth your final version, and I encourage you to educate yourself on open access, ask your librarians for assistance, and offer your research and data to the world as a public good. So um, I think everyone's like ready to leave. I feel, um, shall we still, let's just bring everyone forward. I think it'll be great to just have a quick discussion at, at least. <laughs> Even though it seems like it's endless day <laughs> and night. Yeah, feel free to come down. Just get on down. All right. So I think it's a very interesting discussion tonight, uh, especially with the variability of the presentations. Um, being very familiar with the Open Access Project personally, <laughs> working with Peter the whole entire year last year and advocating to the GSD publication. Oh yeah, you should advertise his book if you want. <laughs> yeah. 
and it's actually on open access. You could actually get it for free online. Um, so I, I feel like I'm, we're like pitching for Peter right now. I'm definitely going to tell him that. Actually, just two weeks ago, I was on the same panel with him on the authorship and ownership issue. So that that was very interesting. I think the the kind of entire group has this participatory kind of um, in a collaborative mindset, which I think is very interesting. Um, I think, Alan, when you were pulling out the, the direction of how users are going and engaging in like more historics in the contextual sense of how buildings are housing data, and then how you know Raul kind of looks into how people are engaging data to how we are storing data. What are the general directions of your thoughts that link all these three um, kind of lectures together? Any f first jabs? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I can start, um, I actually have a question. Uh, are you are you organizing tours? Because I want to take that tour, and there's a bunch of people I want to bring on it. Um, so do the yeah do those exist? Right? I love factory tours. I feel like that would be an awesome walking tour. I mean, in Philly, obviously, you know what best, but in Boston, that'd be an awesome tour. So, so there are tours uh, that are done in Lower Manhattan. Um, I know uh, there's a, an artist named Ingrid Burrington who has some great work. She actually did a guide to the internet and the infrastructure of the internet in Manhattan that just recently came out. Uh, Andrew Bloom, who I mentioned, the author of Tubes, he has done tours for uh, just in general for it's part of like architectural events in Manhattan. I, uh, I could certainly organize something in the Boston area. I actually live in Worcester, which is about 45 miles from here. and we could definitely put something together if people are interested, especially as the weather's getting warmer. Very engaging, yes. definitely. Okay. A lot of people to take that. So I'll work with, I'll email the organizers next definitely. week once definitely. everyone's calmed down. Go forward to everyone. Okay, and yeah, we can kind of go forward with that. Uh, as I said, there's this there's datacentermapblog.com or .org or something. You can get the addresses, we can create a map, we can do some photo documentation. I actually spent the week working with a colleague from uh, Durham University doing some infrastructural walks in Philadelphia and in Worcester, more around um, energy and the urban landscape. He's been working in, in Africa looking at the provision of energy in informal communities and so transferring these ideas from the global south onto the deindustrialized north. So anyway, yes. <laughs> and, and moving forward from that discussion, um, how long did it actually take you to start documenting all the, like, it's obviously your body of work, so how long have, have you been doing this process? It seems like you've kind of traveled quite a bit for it on foot. So the secret about geography is that walking around counts as research. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we should do that for a grant application right there. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I've been doing this for since maybe 2009, 2008, 2009, but really it's a matter of having a camera on hand, accessing sort of so Flickr, Instagram, and these sort of services as a way to do a, like a long-term photo documentation, which also is kind of pulling at the, the, the strange world where you can take pictures of things that then maybe are housed in those things you're taking pictures of. Mm -hmm. um, That's very interesting. And how photo documentation and visual representation is an entry point into these, uh, into these you know, larger processes and systems and, and whatnot. Uh, but it takes a lot of work to find these things, especially the cell phone towers, finding ownership. Uh, I have a paper about that if anyone's interested around the, the everyday aesthetics of so there's this equipment that we use and this juxtaposition between high design of smartphones and sort of mundane everyday design. Um, and the, yeah, the methodologies there are, that's a whole other conversation. And then from that conversation to like, I think the, the drone project, that was actually quite interesting with Yanina. Um, did you watch the news yesterday about the one that went, went into the airspace of DC and that caused a whole the buckle of like you know interesting arrests and everything else. Like, what are your comments on that and how, and, and how like drones are used and then how data is extracted from that, especially with you know the new exhibition that you have. Um, well, I think the drones are fun and exciting to use, obviously, um, but their power really comes from what you do with the data. Um, you know, what can you do with it? Um, so, 
what we did, as I mentioned earlier, was we, we used Structure for Motion software, which basically takes 2D images and then you can create from that. What was the name of the software that you used? Uh, we used uh, two softwares, actually. One of them is Photoscan, which is proprietary, and then we worked with um, Ecosynth, which is an open source uh, version of that. Um, and so that's basically what I'm interested in, and you know, what, what do you do with everything that we collect? came up earlier uh, in the conference today, you know, we see, we can gather all the data, but what do we do with it is, that's what we're going to prioritize. Back to your um, comment about the drones, um, yeah, it's exciting, but it's also, um, you know, there's sort of a legal a landscape that needs to be sorted out still, what's allowed, where, where can you fly, um, so particularly for research purposes, we're still undefined uh, right now, area. It's kind of reminiscent of like the, the research, I think Jim Waldo's looking into privacy and data, especially on the comp side. He's also like, I think the CTO of Harvard. So it, it's actually, it, it's interesting that overlaps. And but, but bring it back to like the social impact aspect of Raul, like when, when you're actually looking at how you're gathering data and how you actually execute it, especially on kind of community scale and more like socially intertwined projects, how does that actually wrap into your research? Yeah, well, I mean, it connects, it connects to this, right? If you look at uh, Jeff Warren and Open Public Labs works around, you know, making the kites and doing the same thing, right? Like, that's an empowerment story because there's gaps in the data that's there. Uh, for instance, in, you know, the, the classic one now of, of mapping the oil spill in New Orleans or sort of mapping marginalized communities where uh, creating your own map can actually be an argument for ownership. Um, uh, so... I think that it definitely connects to this idea that we're now able to empower people to create that data themselves, own the story that's being told about it, and actually advocate with that. And I think that's super exciting, and that connects definitely to this work around what the structures and infrastructure is for not only collecting it, but storing it. And each of these tools along the way has ethical and philosophical approaches baked into it, right? And I think this is sort of one of the key things, is that like, those are often overlooked like the tool chains, we never, we, people often don't consider the implications of to, choosing a tool chain, right? And I think that's a great, I, I really enjoyed the way that you all were speaking about that. And I think that, of, that like wraps really closely to what Ines is actually looking at, and especially the tool chain discussion on how the transference of information on that brings to the, the question. Yeah, I would, I would comment on two things. One is this idea of, of I'm basically interested in, in, in archiving and not only in collecting data, but actually making it accessible in the, in the future. Uh, so we did a project together with MIT that was uh, basically a tool for the capture, description, and, and archiving of, of digital data, of digital drawings. Um, the truth is that right now, the best, the best way to preserve that data is actually not in its native form, but as a PDF. And I'm not satisfied with this. I would love to keep things in their, in their native form. <coughs> so maybe we could like bring a few questions out from the public um, and you know, go ahead, Ho Jose. Um, I don't, I don't. Yeah. I'm enjoying chatting with you all, so it's fine. Yeah, there's two people who might Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for bearing with us like Friday evening so late. Um, just really provocative. Um, after what you've shown us, I had seen some of those data centers, like, but I think I had seen like this really romanticized version that Google, this snapshot of like this building with the uh, pipes painted like red and blue and green and stuff, but no way close to like the real raw truth of like this stack of server. But it's, in, it's so interesting to find like these giants of like data centers. Do you think, can we, say, can we safely assume that um, those are probably the most important buildings for humanity right now? Like if one of those falls down, it's like <laughs> there's a big loss. And if that's the case, these massive cyclopean objects like are we assisting to a process of like a new centralization of the decentralized network or something? I'd... 
Well, the, the nature of those buildings of data centers in general is that it's always duplicated, right? So the co-location points, that place in lower Manhattan, the place in Los Angeles, if that broke, if something happened, um, it would be a problem, but it wouldn't be, you could fix it by rerouting traffic. Things would slow down. The data most likely is, is, is stor stor stored in multiple places. You know, Google doesn't only store Gmail in one place. They're storing it in close to the users around the world. And, and, and that, so these are very important buildings, but it's really the system as a whole. And yet, yes, these buildings do matter. These, these spaces have consequences. And the infrastructure itself, there's a moment that um, Casas Farnellis at the Columbia School of Architecture has a, a story about um, there's a, a, a railroad fire in a tunnel in Baltimore that is like a chemical fire and a big explosion and it melted the tunnel and it melted the fiber optic cables for what happened to be the connection, I, I forget exactly where, but basically I think a Latin American or an African country, their internet went down completely because of a fire in Baltimore. And so it's more that the ramifications are strange and that they're not located just in the areas proximate to these things. But yes, understanding the, the local and the global and sort of how these things are scaling, right, is, is, is part of society today. And these are things we should understand and, and take to heart. Yeah, that's quite fascinating. Actually, this new version of a butterfly effect, where you know a fire in Baltimore creates like something. I, I just love that. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make a comment slash question. I'm not so sure which is what, um, but I really love this panel because there is this sort of uh, symbiosis of like all the aspects of manifestation of data where we have the, phys the physical manifestation within our landscape and then we have the data collection and storing and processing and then the data uses of how it's transformed into you know, this sort of landscape as well but in a completely different way. So I'm really grateful we, we also have this, this all sort of coming together and maybe because at the end, the users might be also the key to um, processing that data. Um, I was just, it's an open question, I guess. Um, and, but there are very different types of users as well, you know, like sort of the researcher and the, the, the kind of scholar and then the sort of citizen um, average Joe, which is me sometimes and in both cases, you know. Um, so I was wondering, like, in terms of uses, how, um, Raul, in your experience, uh, you've looked at, um, do you find that in the end there is a sort of a systematization of how you can anticipate the way that data is going to be used, or are you surprised, or... Um, or is it like some sort of similar it reiteration of this? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, the short answer is I'm consistently surprised. Um, and the people's ability to sort of bring their personal experience to a collection of data and combine that, so take the data, combine their personal experiences and the thing they care about, and then turn that into some action they do with it is consistently surprising because, I mean, data, the thing about uh, da data is like, it's often like, it's the context of it is almost never acknowledged in, I mean, all this big data bullshit, right? Right? I mean, the data, I, I'm, I'm a big, like, you know, I'm on the, I'm in the Kate Crawford camp. So let's say that uh, of sort of data. Um, so, so I think that people's ability to sort of look at information, find the holes in it and the disconnects with reality um, is very powerful. And I mean, as we all know, we measure the things that are easy to measure, right? I mean, you look at what Edith was talking about and the quantified self, and like, combine that with the with her opening Socrates quote, and like, we're not we're not quantifying how ethical we are each day, because that's really hard to measure. We're like quantifying how many steps we take because that's easy to measure. Who gives a crap how many steps we take? That's not a reflective life worth living. You know, that's not what he means, right? So so. That's that. I think that com that manifests itself whenever data is combined with people's lived experience to try to put things together and and make some sign of story. Um, that answer your question. 
Are there any other questions, perhaps? Thank you. First of all, that was very interesting. And um, Raul, this is for you. Um, about community engagement with data and working with community engagement in planning with data uh, specifically. So first of all, your talk was amazing. And it made me think about Anne Winston's work with uh, landscape literacy in Penn. Um, Pennsylvania, and um, it kind of brought this idea of bringing community together around data. And I know a lot of people recently that have been working on OSRPs for small towns in Massachusetts and a master plan for Berniston. And one of the issues that they've come across is that they can get at least some data for these areas, but people have kind of a psychological block to even getting to that point where you can start to engage them in ways of storybooks and in these activities where you can really start con to connect people and start to break down that fear that they have of data. So I'm wondering if you could speak to like just that opening process of getting people to even start the dialogue in the first place um, with it because I, I think that fear is there a lot for people, especially in these smaller towns. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I completely agree with that. Um, the first thing that we do is we never talk about those activities as as data activities. Like, we're not bringing people together to look at data and do a data analysis. Like, we're bringing people together to work on the issue of open space planning, right? And we happen to be doing it by making storybooks out of uh, information or maps they have about how much green space there is or whatever. Um, so the language we use is critically important in engaging people. And we know that, right? I mean, you sit here and you hear today, I heard so much design language, right? Because people make these assumptions about being at the GSD and using sort of native languages and discourses. And like, I don't, no offense, I don't speak design. Um, so a bunch of the stuff was like, pff, I was looking up words on my phone to understand what they meant or what they might mean. Um, so language is really important. And when I'm doing community work, I talk about information that we have. And everyone's like, okay, cool, we have information in our community group. That's fine. Um, I talk about using that information to get something done, right? I'm not talking about data storytelling. That's not something I really talk about in those settings. Um, and I think that, that, and then the key, the other key piece is finding the key partners at the stakeholders that actually can put that together with you that don't have that fear, right? So the first, in our sort of like how to do a data mural thing we have on our website, the first step is find the stakeholders at the partner communities who want to filter the data to start to reduce it into something that people can start working with. So those murals usually start with a maybe two or four page handout of tables and pie charts, right? Which literacy in this country is pretty high for tables and pie charts. Um, you still need to ease into that, but um, those are some of the approaches we use. The other key piece is sort of making sure that we understand where people are starting from, right? So it's that meeting people where they are, which is true of any good sort of design intervention. You define who the people are, you go talk to them, you figure out where they're starting from, you meet them there, and then you hold, them, you hold their hand along the path to getting where you think might be helpful to them. Does that help? And then check out the website or talk to me afterwards. There's a bunch more sort of case studies. I don't know if other people have approaches or they use for that. I just would reiterate too, I think it's something that I think is really important. It's getting around this idea of, of representation of data in ways that aren't just digital, yeah. especially in say a small town context. It's, so you can make a website, but is that actually the most useful way? Whereas a mural is, a mural of data is important and it could, if that's leading to conversations, et cetera, that could be really powerful. Yeah, those, it's like a, the mural is like a Trojan horse, right? It's because data isn't necessarily like the way to make a good argument. It's one more way that we can actually make arguments and try to achieve change. And not necessarily better, but we got to try and see. I think it's like very good that we have kind of engagement on the form of academia, kind of the more physical space, and also like arts and community work. So I think maybe what we'll do is like wrap up, and if there's any questions. You know, feel free to speak to the speakers afterwards um, when when they depart. And uh, it was, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Well, um, not very much closing remarks to make here. Thanks, <laughs> thank you to our last panel for bearing with us. Thanks to the audience bearing with us tonight here. It's been a great conversation. We hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did organizing it and conducting it. And um, quoting Sarah, like, may all of us share our data with the world in an open access <laughs> way. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Woo!